Sunday night offering of astronomy outreach for September the 25th, the Sunday night astronomy show. Yay! 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 And this is episode number 146. Wow. 146. Coming up to 150 pretty soon. I guess there's only four shows. Yeah. Yeah. Four more. Anyway, okay. Um, my name is Chris Kerwin. I'm the creator of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay. I'm an amateur astronomer and a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the New Brunswick chapter. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome back our regular co-host and fellow RAS member, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moonshadow Observatory in beautiful Hampton, NB. Hey, Paul. Hello. Evening. Ah. evening. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, welcoming back our other uh, regular co-host and fellow RAS member, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in beautiful St. John. Welcome, Mike. Hello. PFO. Silent P. First of all, I guess we should mention, uh, we hope everybody's doing okay um, after that uh, wild weekend we had um, with the hurricane. Um, we know a lot of people had uh, power issues and uh, flooding issues and, and much more than that. But uh, mm. we're, we're thinking of all of you out there who are still struggling, uh, trying to get through uh, the weekend. So uh, our prayers are with you. And from there, we're going to uh, go to our topics for tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. Um, now, September is a great time to be looking up, and next week in particular presents a number of activities to be watching for, from our closest opposition to Jupiter in 59 years, to a NASA spacecraft on a collision course with an asteroid, to a special local event next weekend. We'll take a closer look at what's happening there. Also tonight, uh, Mike will be bringing back another Binal Bud with another wonderful binocular target of the week. Hey! Yeah. And uh, I'll be offering a quick view of what to watch for in this week's sky. Um, Paul is going to be bringing us an Astro uh, Tip of the Week. And uh, Rosanna was kind enough to offer us another uh, Rosanna's Fun Fact to contribute for the evening. So, great. And I'll have uh, your wonderful photo submissions to share as well. So that's all coming tonight. Now, this is a family-friendly, interactive, live broadcast. So for those of you joining you from my Facebook or uh, page or YouTube channel. Uh, we are happy to try and answer all of your astronomy questions here in real time as well. And of course, we'd like to welcome back all of those who have been joining us through the local Rogers TV network. Thank you for your support. Yes. yes. Uh, Paul is in a pumpkin patch. Paul is in a pumpkin patch. We're trying to find the great pumpkin. We don't know which one's the great pumpkin, but we're the great for... pumpkin. I'm sitting here. I'm waiting for Linus to show up, and we're going to have ourselves a time. <laughs> I've got my partner. Time. <laughs> I got my marker because uh, these pumpkins are all faceless, and uh, we're going to put faces on each and every one of them, awesome. and we're going to have a war uh, full of uh, pumpkins. So, do we get to name them? <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. If you like? Pick, yeah. your, pick your pumpkin and name it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's get started then, guys, with tonight's program uh, and a discussion around some of the things that are happening uh, next week. Well, we did have one event that had to be canceled, but uh, we'll talk about that in a second. So I'm just going to bring up a little bit of a slide show here, just a few slides. 
Paul is a great pumpkin. There you go. <laughs> I agree. Okay, um, let me share my screen. And we're going to share this one. Okay, so uh, just when I was noticing, there are a few things that were coming up uh, in the next week. Uh, find my slideshow from the beginning. Here we go. Uh, of course, the, probably one of the bigger ones uh, is the uh, Monday evening Jupiter uh, at opposition. Now, on Monday night, Jupiter reaches opposition with the Earth. In other words, you could draw a line that intersects the Sun, our Earth, and Jupiter. Now, Jupiter reaches opposition about every 13 months. It takes us about 13 months to catch up to Jupiter, because Jupiter is moving in its orbit as we're moving around at the same time. So what's so special about this one? Well, today, actually, Jupiter reached its, its closest approach to Earth in 59 years at uh, only 587 million, uh, 200,000 kilometers. Only. And only, yeah. Just Ooh. around the corner. Right. And, uh, right. and tomorrow, the Earth rests between Jupiter and our Sun. Uh, it'll be the closest approach in 59 years since 1963. Now, Jupiter will rise in the east as the Sun sets in the west. That's what usually happens at opposition and will be uh, will stay visible until sunrise. It also means that the giant planet will appear to be bigger and brighter than usual. Now, our local forecast shows for uh, rain tomorrow and clouds tomorrow night and Tuesday night. So don't worry about, I mean, here it's just because it's a celestial event that we're not going to get to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so we, 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 we're used to disappointment now. Uh, but yeah. what will happen is that it will be big and bright like this for the next couple of weeks. It's not going to be just uh, just one night. So if you go out in the evening sky right now, um, if it's clear tonight, and look east, they're going to see a very bright star. And it's the brightest thing in the sky right now. It is the brightest object in the night sky. Um Usually it would uh, be just behind Venus, but Venus isn't in our evening sky. So, and the moon is uh, just turned new today, so it's not uh, an issue. So it is the brightest thing. So it's standing right out there like a big spotlight. Um, so, yeah, that I mean the the reason why it's at its closest approach to uh, us in 59 years is that of course we're farther away from the sun right now than we are in the sum in the winter time. We're actually closer. But all of us go around the sun in elliptical type orbit, and I believe Jupiter is at perihelion right now too. So that's why. So it's at its closest approach to the sun. So we're farther out. Jupiter's closer. It brings us at our closest approach in 59 years. Pretty cool. What's up, Mike? I didn't say. I said oh. 59 years. <laughs> <laughs> So if you have a telescope, um, and if you are uh, interested in looking at planets, now is the time. Mm. Now, remember, you don't need a telescope to check out Jupiter either. Um, binoculars gives you an awesome view of Jupiter and its four little moons. You'll see four little dots beside it, depending on where they are yeah. located. Um, a small telescope will also reveal Jupiter and, and uh, its bands uh, pretty easily. Um, when you start to get up to a, like an 8-inch scope, you're going to get a, a really nice view. And the thing about Jupiter now, of course, it's nice and high um, when it's early in the evening. So you've got less atmosphere to look through, so your views of Jupiter will improve. This one is actually from the Juno spacecraft that's orbiting Jupiter uh, now. It uh, does things called per perovies, I believe they're called, where it kind of goes in close to Jupiter and then spins all the way, goes way out far again because of the massive radiation that Jupiter gives off. It would fry the electronics. So. It can only stay in orbit around Jupiter a short time. But when it does, it flies in quickly and snaps a bunch of images and collects a bunch of data and flies back out again. Mm -hmm. That same spacecraft is actually going to be going around uh, Europa very soon, coming to within, I think, 300 kilometers of the surface of Europa, which is pretty close. Um, and it's the first time that we've actually uh, got images from Europa since the Voyager mission. So that's going to be really interesting. That's coming up, too. Wow. Okay, so keep an eye out for Jupiter uh, at opposition over the next few uh, next couple of weeks. You'll still get some nice views of Jupiter. Let's move ahead to uh, what's happening tomorrow night as well, um, which is NASA's DART mission. Um, you've probably heard about this. NASA's double asteroid redirection test, or DART, is set to make history on Monday as the world's first planetary defense test. And the spacecraft's own mini-photographer, which is uh, Lucia, Lucia 
Cube, short for Light Italian CubeSat for Imaging Asteroids, is actually warming up to capture the event. Now, it's programmed to document the effects of DART's impact, capturing unique images of the asteroid surface, as well as of the debris eject ejected from the newly formed crater with its two optional cameras, or optical cameras. Uh, the mission's target is Dimorphos, uh, a small asteroid that is about 150 meters in diameter and orbits a larger object, uh, a one kilometer wide asteroid named Didymos. Now, at a distance of about one kilometer, Oh, a distance about one kilometer uh, separates the two right now with Dimorphos completing one orbit around Didymos about every 11 hours and 55 minutes. Now, um, DART will essentially be a self-driving suicidal spacecraft guiding itself to its demise with people uh, at the Admission Operations Center at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, Maryland, just largely being spectators. A DART's camera will not spot Dimorphos as a separate dot from Didymos, until about an hour before the crash. Uh, then it will adjust its flight path, ending in a glorious collision. Now, did, uh, DART is set to crash into Dimorphos at 12,400 kilometers per hour at about 8.14 p.m. Atlantic time on Monday. Uh, now, NASA television actually will be broadcasting coverage of this at uh, the end of this mission, beginning at 7 p.m. Uh, Atlantic time. So if you want to catch the, uh, the highlights, you should be able to catch it on NASA TV uh, or on YouTube and wherever else they, they broadcast. So, something to look forward to. Um, interesting kind of a mission there, guys, eh? And Mike, you're gonna sh maybe you can show us that chart uh, later there. Yeah. That you had there uh, of other missions watching it. Like I said, the part that I found interesting is they're actually gonna take the time and point Hubble and James Webb at it as well. Hmm. To see if they can capture it. So, that's pretty neat. So, it's, uh, it's point of shooting the the satellite at the smaller asteroid is not to um, alter the path of that around the sun, but only to alter the orbit around the larger asteroid. Yeah, uh, so the, the smaller asteroid is the moonlet of the bigger asteroid. And right. what they're going to do is not only image the They'll get the, they'll catch the debris of the collision, but they won't actually see the collision. But it will. They're hoping that it's going to either speed up or slow down uh, the speed of the orbit of it around the larger asteroid. Right. Yeah. Which, is, but it's got nothing to do with its orbit in relation to the sun. No. Is no. Not at all. And, and neither of these are are at risk for uh, coming into contact with our Earth at any time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Not until they collide with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> well, they'll have to be a dart too, I guess. <laughs> That's the wrong way, isn't it? <laughs> I hope Bruce Willis isn't retired. <laughs> yeah. I, really, but it really, it's it's a pretty amazing mission when you think about you know the the second rock uh, was 150 meters across and uh, yeah. the smaller one like one's a half a half a kilometer and the other one's 150 meters. So to you know to find that i think it's six million miles away yeah and then it's hit crazy it crazy yeah and then hit it yeah crazy distance so um and like you said it's only going to know it's there an hour before exactly it. yeah and it so, its path yeah yeah and this how how far away is this from us how far out there is this it's about six million kilometers or something i think it's farther than that from us i um well i know it's no i'd have to look it up somebody will have to look it up and let us know Okay. Exactly where it is, but um, of course, the artist, it, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say the reason I, I say that is because it's so small in relation to how we see it that they actually have to monitor uh, whether or not it slowed it down by looking at the dimming of the uh, of the larger asteroid. Yeah, yeah. Because as it, of course, as anything goes around and in front of anything else, it has a dimming effect on the light. How we find exoplanets and all that other stuff. Right. But anyway, we're going to use that same sort of technique to see, based on the time that it dims and the cycle that it goes around, if in fact did it slow it down. Oh, amazing stuff. Yeah. Incredible that these people are doing this stuff. Oh, it's just unbelievable. Very smart group. Okay, um, we'll go on to Artemis One. Uh, of course, that launch has been postponed now till late October, and the reason why, I mean, they did go through a fuel test, and the fuel test went okay that hydrogen leak that they had uh, earlier. Uh, we were hoping for better news, but NASA has decided to delay the launch of Artemis 1 once again, this time out of safety as Hurricane Ian 
uh, threatens to disrupt, or Tropical Storm Ian, I guess, but it's going to change to a hurricane, uh, threatens to disrupt the area around uh, the expected launch window. Um, now, the Artemis 1 is being moved back to the uh, Vehicle Assembly Building for safety. Artemis 1 will place the Orion spacecraft into orbit around the moon before the capsule returns to Earth for a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. Now, this unmanned test is to test all the systems before we place astronauts on board, of course. Uh, that will happen with Artemis 2, and then Artemis 3 is the one that will carry the first astronauts to walk on the moon in over 50 years. So, still go for Artemis, let's hope. Maybe the, the storm will pass away. Hmm? Is it October 23rd or something, the new yeah. launch? I think it's a, it's a, the 23rd or so, yeah, right around the end of the month. Another month away. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Unfortunately. Maybe a bit of Halloween lunch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the other thing I didn't want to mention this, uh, this week is October 1st, actually, which is the International Observe the Moon Night. Now, on Saturday, October 1st, astronomers from around the globe set up their telescopes for the public in celebration of our moon. Now, the annual event is known as the International Observe the Moon Night. And uh, it's promoted really highly by NASA. Now, our event on October 1st, well, members of the St. John Astronomy Club and the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the New Brunswick chapter, will be celebrating International Observe the Moon Night by offering views through the eyepieces of our telescopes. Now, this event takes place in conjunction with the Irving Nature Park in St. John and will take place within the park. Uh, the event begins at 7.30 and lasts until 10 p.m. And, and uh, the gates actually close at 6 and they'll open up again at 6.30 to allow people to come in. Uh, the event is free, and all are welcome to attend. The cloud date will be Sunday, October the 2nd. So we're hoping for good weather. There's 10.6 million kilometers. Thank you, Richard. That's the distance of it. So, And the asteroid will be singing, I don't like Mondays, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was one massive headache. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, okay, so that's uh, that's all I've got for that. And I'll stop presenting here. Oh, just uh, it was a, a bit of a disappointment uh, uh, the weekend. This weekend, actually, we didn't get to have our Kusha uh star party, which was the last star party of the year for the province of New Brunswick uh, due to the storm, uh, which I guess was a, a wise thing because we would have had some uh, astronomers getting a higher <laughs> elevated look at things. And, uh, hey, if, they, if it still went on, you would have been blown away. <laughs> <laughs> As, uh, wah, wah. as uh, Stefan says, uh, the, the views would have been out of this world. Yes, yeah. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> anyway, so that was unfortunate, but uh, this year we had a good run. We had uh, uh, three of the four uh, that went very, very well, and um, and it, it was a great season, and it was really good to see some people out and about again doing what uh, they should be doing, looking up at the sky on the, in a night that, that's clear or so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Look forward well, to next year. Yeah, that's right. Always next year. Um, yeah, so anyway, we've got that, that nice event at the end of the week, which should hopefully uh, turn out to be clear sky for that one. Uh, we got a chance at two nights anyway, I guess, so one of the two. It's a first quarter moon uh, right around that time too, so that's a great time to be showing the moon uh, through the telescope. If you come out and you see me at the, at the eyepiece, uh, I usually have a – these guys know – <laughs> I usually have a smartphone adapter hooked up and you can come to my telescope and take a picture of the moon through the telescope. And, and rain date, mention the rain date. And the rain date is October 2nd, yeah. So Saturday, Saturday night from 7.30 till 10, rain date is Sunday uh, from 7.30 to 10, same time. So hopefully we'll see you there. Yeah. Hopefully it'll happen. Hopefully it'll <laughs> happen, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Unless the moon cancel. Yeah. Well, yeah, that might, could happen. <laughs> She's a good girl, though. I don't think so. No. I hit it with Artemis. Never, she never disappoints. <laughs> None of its orbit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the DART mission, I'm going to be tuned in myself, I think, tomorrow night just to watch on that. So I might be live here. So uh, keep an eye out. It should be interesting to see what happens. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's our discussion phase, I guess, for tonight. How about we talk okay. about... Uh, hey, let, me, hmm? let me show that photograph. Oh, yes. Please. Right. Please. Yes. So we found this. Not only, you know, is... Uh, these are all the telescopes, uh, big telescopes around the world that are actually going to be pointed towards where this uh, DART mission is going to happen, including HST, uh, James Webb, and Lucy. So all of these scopes, as, as it rotates, the Earth rotates and uh, it comes into view, they're going to be watching it with all these, you know, all these different scopes around the world. So this is a big event for NASA. And you, you know, said, and, yeah. You said Hubble and, uh, and yeah. Uh, Webb too, yeah. 
I mean, it's the worldwide observing campaign is what they're calling it. So, you know, that, that's pretty cool to see all of this stuff, you know, come together just to watch one, one quick event to see if it works. Mm. So, yeah. Pretty important. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. it's, it's groundbreaking technology. I mean, it, it's as simple as it is. Um, it's, it, at the same time, it's so important. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Let's hope we never need it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so let's go from there to uh, an Astro Tip of the Week. Paul, would you be ready for an Astro Tip of the Week? Okay. All right. Let me just open that up. Put it in the right space. Chris says the Astro will soon be singing I Don't Like Mondays. Yeah, but we can't sing it though, Chris. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not the one. That's the one. Will this work? Uh, yeah, that'll work. Okay, good. All right. So uh, my Astro Tip of the Week is really going to be quite a short, simple one, but one that I think uh, may help a lot of people. And it is about... The best time to shoot the full moon with one shot. So um, a lot of people try to get a picture where they got the picture of the moon. Oh. And at the same time, uh, a nice foreground in the front, you know, to shoot it from. That's because typically when we would shoot the, a, a moon rising, we want to see, you know, th that effect that makes it look so big. And so there are ways to do that. And I covered that in another uh, segment before, but, but that's not what this talk is about. This one is just about the simplicity of what you need to do. So the way to do that, first of all, what, what you don't do is, um, is try to do the full moon after the night after the actual full moon happened. Because if you do, that full moon's gonna come up a fair bit of time later than the one before which means that the sun is going to be down and whatever it was lighting up is not lit up anymore. So what you're going to have is a big white ball in the sky if you want any foreground. Again, talking one single shot, unless you want to take multiple shot shots and put them together. But a lot of people just like to take a camera, go out, shoot this thing, and then you know post it for their friends. So that's what this is kind of about. How can you do this simply? So too dark will not allow a bright enough foreground, as you can see in this image, because I was able to get the moon behind something because it was so bright, at least it lit that up. And then also, if you look up here in the top corner, there was Jupiter and a small moon. So, you know, I made something out of nothing, I guess, on that one. So when it is ideal is when it's bright enough that the foreground uh, um, can happen when the sun is setting and the moon is rising. And there's a reason for that, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But if I had to wait it or try to shoot this particular shot, like I did the one just before, I, I would have had the same result. I would have had a black foreground and a light moon. If I expose for the foreground, the moon gets blown out. If I expose for the moon, the foreground goes black. So, uh, so there's, a, there's a very specific time where you can take one picture and capture it all. So basically, here's how it works. When the moon rises, the sun sets at the full moon. So if you look at this diagram uh, right here, you'll see that this is the sun, this is the earth, and this would be full moon. So what happens is uh, you are in twilight when the sun is setting and the moon is rising. And that's why you're actually able to do that. There are three different types of twilight, so I'll go over that in a second, but, but this allows the light to still be on your foreground subject. And that's why it's important to either shoot it the very night that that full moon is coming up or the night before, because even though it's not a complete full moon, most people can't tell the difference. And unless they look at the charts to see how much it was illuminated, I, I beg to differ to look at it naked eye and see, oh, that's not a full moon. So you can do it that way if you want to, but it will be um, a little higher in the sky uh, or the sun will be coming down a little bit later. So at the equator, civil twilight, which is what we're talking about here, can last as little as 24 minutes. So you got to make sure you are where you're supposed to be when that moon is coming up over that horizon that you chose. Um, and uh, this is true because at low latitudes, the sun's apparent movement is perpendicular to the observer's uh, horizon. 
but at the poll, civil twilight can be as long as two or three weeks if you're at the poll, but most of us aren't at the poll, so that's not really relevant. So here's what happens. We have civil and nautical twilight times. So at the equator, civil twilight can last as little as 24 minutes. And again, that's kind of just what I just read a moment ago, but here's the illustration. So as the sun starts to set, while we're in that civil um, twilight, which is about six degrees, it's still casting a fair bit of light over here. So whatever your foreground subject it happens to be, whether it's a mountain, a building, or you know some place where there's no light, and maybe it's a specific tree line, who knows what it's going to be, um, you're able to light it up with the civil twilight. If you get there and it starts to get into nautical twilight, you're going to find it harder and harder to get that balance where you can still get moon, detail, and foreground. And this is the reason why. So this is why it's so, so important to make sure that when you shoot this, shoot it when it's going to be either the full moon or the night before, uh, but the full moon is the best time because then you still have lots of, um, uh, of uh, light because cameras that are sensitive today go pick it up anyway. So anyway, so that's it. That was my uh, little chat on the best time to shoot the moon, uh, the full moon in one single shot rather than having to stack a bunch of stuff. Awesome, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Good tips. Always good tips there. I never would have thought you used that sunlight to light up the foreground. Duh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? I mean, I've been doing this a long time. And yeah. uh, we, we talked, Chris and I talked about this the other day. Yep. And certain times of the year, we're talking to way different angles, too, that the moon, oh, yeah. the moon rise. So that slows it down an awful lot. Mm, so sure. anyway, there's a lot of things to consider. But regardless of the time of the year, whenever the sun is going down and the moon is coming up at a full moon phase, it's always equal. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, cool. yeah, this time right now around this on this fall equinox is when we get to see that real shallow angle of the ecli ecliptic happening, right? So the moon stays mm. lower or rises only about half hour later each night rather than an hour. Actually, it's spinning around to almost an hour now. So ecliptic is changing already. Yeah. We're already heading towards winter. Hmm? Yeah, that's what happened with that shot that I showed you in the beginning with the with that tower power tower. Mm. Uh, that's exactly. I said, geez. Where's the moon? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come, on, come on, come on. <laughs> come on, come on. Where's that flashlight? <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing, I suppose, yeah. Where's bring that flight. <laughs> okay, how about a bino bud? Bino bud. Uh, Brad says, my experience has been the night before and also the morning after the full moon are the two best times. Uh, get to the moon set <laughs> it's big on the horizon all righty ocular target of the week this week by bino bud is in one of our favorite areas of the sky <laughs> saying that oh boy sca 29 <laughs> or the cooling tower <laughs> now don't think of three mile island but that's when they think of cooling towers i guess that's what they think of so it's called the cooling tower because it has kind of that shape well, Messier 29 is also known as the Cooling Tower. It's an open cluster located in the constellation Cygnus. <laughs> la, la, Orion, la, 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 la. Yeah, in the Orion arm of the Milky Way galaxy and a local group of galaxies. It's about 3,700 light years away from Earth. It's best viewed during the early spring, or actually right now. And it's a magnitude 6.6, .6, can be viewed nicely in binoculars. And I'll explain why right now. If you go out at 10 o'clock, look literally straight up, <laughs> you're going to see Deneb. Well, you come down from the Deneb, Deneb in the Northern Cross or Cygnus or whatever you like to call it, in the, the center star Sadar, and you come down just a little bit, and you'll find M29 right in here. Real easy to find. Like I said, you find Deneb, it's the whole summer triangle, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Find Deneb, come down to Sadar. And M29 will be right there, and it's virtually straight up at 10 o'clock. The only thing you're going to do is hurt your neck. Here's just another way of using a Telrad finder, if you were, and that's where it'll be. What does it look like? Well, this is it. If you take a photograph of it, there's not quite now what you're going to see. But you see the, the stars here curve, the stars on this side curve, and it gives you that cooling tower or guitar body effect, I guess, would be another way to do it. Now, in 10 by 50 binoculars, it is a small target. But if you're looking at the moon, it's about the size of the Sea of Tranquility. So 
it's this little thing right here, and you will see both sides curve in like a cooling tower, and that's why they call it the cooling tower. Next to the full moon, again, like I said, it's about the size of the Sea of Tranquility. It is a small target, but it's actually easy to spot once you see it. And, of course, this is what happens when you have the Sunny Acres nudist camp. <laughs> <laughs> And that's been our target of the week by Bino Bud. Clear sky. Who's care? Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Saggy anchors. Another, another, <laughs> another Cygnus target. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Must be it's 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 it is. It's yeah, literally straight well, up. Yeah, we won't have them around too much longer. No, you don't have to look. <laughs> look up. That's all it takes. That's all. Real easy to find. Okay, just bear with me for a second. I'm just going to close a couple of things here and uh, I'm going to check on something. And okay, all right. Um, so we're going to go from here then to uh, what's up talk. What's up talk? What's up talk? Just a few things that uh, we're looking at this week. Jupiter. Um, Jupiter. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I think, I think, I think I yeah, I think I do mention Jupiter. And um, let me go into uh, share screen here. Actually, when Jupiter's up, if you look just to the east at four o'clock in the morning, Mars is up there too, besides the Deborah on it. It looks nice. It yes, was, uh, pops right out there. Yes, it does. Maybe we'll talk about it on its way to Orion. <laughs> there. <laughs> okay, what's up this week in the sky? Um, Let's take a look. First of all, early this week, the zodiacal light. Now, now that the moon has disappeared from the evening sky, uh, these last few days of the month are excellent time for trying your hand at spotting the zodiacal light. Now, often called the false dawn at this time of year, the uh, zodiacal light now appears in the east before sunrise, while the sky is still dark. Now, the best views will come from a high up observing site with a clear view of the eastern horizon and little to no light pollution. So look for a soft cone-shaped glow thrusting upward from the horizon in Leo and extending along the ecliptic running through Cancer and Gemini as it narrows. What causes a strange almost other world glow? It is actually sunlight scattering off dust grains that are scattered throughout the inner solar system. Now this myriad of grains has been sloughed off by comets as they round the sun and warm up and that uh, tends to leave material behind. So that's what we see. So it's very faint, but uh, you are able to image it. I've seen a number of people here that, including Trudy, has imaged, uh, imaged it uh, nicely. So keep an eye out for that. There's a zodiacal light in the morning sky in the east before sunrise. Um, also, all week, here we go, Mike. Mars Got rises it. with Mars rises with Taurus. Uh, another planet joins the evening sky besides uh, Jupiter and Saturn. The red planet Mars now rises with Taurus right around 11 p.m. A decent-sized telescope will begin to reveal, reveal some of its features. They should become clearer, though, as we approach opposition with Mars in December. Now, there's another nice thing that's coming up in December when Mars is at opposition, and it's going to be occulted by the moon. So that's going to be a fascinating uh, event to watch. The moon will pass in front of Mars. Um, you may find that Mars appears similar to the red giant star Aldebaran. Uh, now the reddish star Aldebaran, the fiery, fiery eye of the bull, in the constellation, Taurus is easy to find. It's part of a V-shaped group of stars right in here that we call the Hyades. And that forms the bull's face. Now, Aldebaran is an aging, huge star. The diameter is between 35 and 40 times the size of our sun. Now, if Aldebaran replaced our sun, its surface would extend almost out to the orbit of Mercury. While you're in the area, be sure to check out the beautiful Pleiades star cluster up here um, as well, best viewed with binoculars. So lots to see in, in our evening sky coming through September. I know we're getting into the winter constellations, but they're still very pretty. Uh, let's move ahead then to tonight's uh, sky with a new moon. Our, new, our moon turned new actually this evening at 6.54 p.m. Atlantic time. Now when our moon is new, it is an excellent time to consider stargazing. Artificial light from the moon can cause problems when you're trying to enjoy those deep sky treasures. You'll get the best views around the new phase of the moon. That means, uh, so if the moon is new tonight, then by tomorrow evening, it's about one day old. And unfortunately, it looks like our weather's not going to cooperate. So um, 
Yeah, I know. I try to catch it every month, but I can't seem to catch it this month. Uh, that's always a difficult m moon, and not mon, to spot in our evening sky as it sets shortly after the sunset. I did this uh, presentation. We have got it. Yeah, we well, we got it. Yeah, we've got it less than tw less than uh, twenty four hours too. I think we got yeah. a twenty twenty hour moon, Mike. Twenty hours, something like that. Yeah. I always see it as a great challenge though to try and catch it as often as the weather allows. Now, sunset locally tomorrow is at seven fifteen p.m. Atlantic time. The moon sets uh, takes place at seven twenty eight, so not very much time there. Uh, that leaves a very brief window to spot it. Uh, and being only 1% illuminated, actually I should say 748, uh, being 1% uh, illuminated, it makes for a tough target, but worth a try if you have clear skies. Now be sure the sun has set, of course, before you get out there with binoculars and try to spot it. But you can spot it with binoculars, and uh, we've done it before, and we've actually offered it before as a live feed. So That's right. Uh, it is kind of neat to catch. This one's a 25-hour moon, I guess. Now, again, of course, Jupiter opposition. Uh, Sunday Jupiter will reach its closest distance to Earth in 59 years at around 587 million kilometers. On Monday, the gas giant will re reach opposition, meaning it will appear opposite the Sun to those on Earth. Now, Jupiter will rise in the east while the Sun sets in the west. The two events will make Jupiter appear brighter and larger in the sky with the best views uh, Monday night, according to NASA. However, the planet will appear slightly bigger and brighter for the next few weeks. So we have lots of time yet to, to enjoy Jupiter. I think we get Jupiter right up until December this year. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Um, now, not only will Jupiter be at opposition, uh, but Monday evening will present a great opportunity to view the great red spot on Jupiter. Now, it comes into view around 9.45 uh, p.m., is right there. The red spot, of course, is a persistent high-pressure region in the atmosphere of Jupiter, at least twice the size of Earth, producing an anticyclonic storm that is the largest in the solar system. Jupiter's great red spot was first discovered in 1831 by amateur astronomer Samuel Henrik Schwabe, uh, so we know the storm has existed for at least 150 years. Now, there are two good opportunities to view the GRS this week, Monday evening and again Wednesday evening around midnight. Um, a few other things about uh, Jupiter. We're going to keep going on Jupiter here for a second. Wednesday, September the 28th, Ganymede Shadow Transit. Now, there are a number of times this week that one of the Jupiter's moons transits across the face of the gas giant, from our point of view. Ganymede is Jupiter's largest moon, and bigger than Mercury, actually. In fact, if Ganymede was orbiting the Sun instead of Jupiter, it would be considered a planet. Uh, now, there's a nice Ganymede transit of Jupiter early Wednesday morning, and I mean early, uh, so 1.12 a.m., uh, Ganymede begins the transit of Jupiter. Uh, at the same time, uh, Ganymede's shadow begins to cross Jupiter. And then at, by 3.44, Ganymede ends its transit, and at 4.02, Ganymede's shadow leaves Jupiter's disk. So you can see it's uh, leaving at a different time. But, but you can watch these shadows pass right across the planet, so they're, they're pretty neat. They're pretty hard to pick up the planets or the moons themselves, but uh, you can see their shadows pretty easy. Uh, Friday evening, um, the moon meets Antares. Now, we'll watch the evening skies on Friday night, as just after sunset, as our crescent moon now has Earth shine. Uh, that's that uh, glow that the moon gets uh, from sunlight reflecting back on the moon and back at us again. Uh, it greets the red giant star Antares in Scorpius. Now, being relatively cool at only 3,400 degrees, uh, our sun is 5,500 degrees, Antares is still bright to our naked eye, and that's because Antares is a red supergiant star. In fact, if you placed our sun and Antares side by side, you'd find Antares more than 10,000 times brighter than our sun, and it would be about 700 times the sun's diameter. So it's a wow. long ways away, but it's still very bright, and that tells you that it's a big. Um, let's, go big. From, mm, let's go from there to uh, October the 1st. Uh, Saturday, which is uh, Io's turn to transit across uh, the face of Jupiter. Little Io has its turn of transiting on October the 1st. Io is the closest Galilean moon to Jupiter and is the only other world in the solar system where we have actually found active volcanoes. Voyager 1 or Voyager 1 or Voyager 2? Voyager 1, I believe, uh, captured uh, active volcanoes on Io. So with this one, uh, we're looking at after midnight, so 44 minutes after midnight, Io begins its transit of Jupiter. Uh, at 50 minutes after, Io's shadow begins to cross Jupiter. At 2.58, um, Io ends its transit across Jupiter. And at 3.06, that should say, should say ADT time. 
at 3.06, Io's shadow leaves the Jupiter's disk. So you've got almost uh, three hours, two and a half hours there to watch Io's shadow cross across the face of Jupiter. Now, interesting thing about this is that part of the transit at the very end, around 2.45 a.m., Io and its shadow will appear just above the Great Red Spot. So that right would in, be cool. Right in here. So that it would be cool to see. You can almost watch it go right by it. Yeah, yeah. Cool. It'd be great for a photo uh, if somebody had the opportunity there to capture it. So, yeah, um, don't see that very often, I don't think. Maybe we do. I don't know. Okay, and again, we did mention Saturday, October 1st, International Observe the Moon Night. Amateur astronomers from around the world will be setting up their telescopes to offer views of the celestial neighbors to the public, or celestial neighbor to the public. Uh, we'll also be offering a public outreach locally in St. John inside the Irving Nature Park. Members of the St. John Astronomy Club and RASC NB will be offering a two-and-a-half-hour night observing session in conjunction with the staff of the Irving Nature Park. Now, the event starts at 7.30 and ends at 10 and is free and all ages are welcome. So, again, the gates will close at 6 o'clock at the park. They'll open again at uh, 6.30 and uh, then the public is allowed to come up and uh, join us. And then uh, right around 7.30, we usually do like, just a little short presentation about what we're going to be talking about. And we'll have a nice full quarter, first quarter moon there. There'll be... Uh, Jupiter and Saturn, of course, to, be, to view. They'll be in nice prime viewing locations, so we're looking forward to it. Always yeah, it's always a good time. Always a good time up there, yeah. Lots of people. That's for sure. Oh, uh, Lisa was kind enough to send me her newest uh, uh, chart for the month of October, so um, here's her event uh, list for what's happening throughout the month of October. She has International Observe the Moon Night included here on the 1st. Uh, several other events, the full moon uh, challenge, two shadows on Jupiter. There you are on October 13th. That would be kind of neat to see, two shadows. Uh, so, yeah, uh, lots of uh, things that are happening here. She always lists the events. She lists the date. Uh, she lists the peak time, when's the best time to view, and what you need to view it with, either naked eye, binoculars, or a telescope. So I recommend that you go follow Lisa at Lisa's Look Up Astronomy and More. Now she's at Ruby Moonbeams on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you, Lisa, for that. And uh, this is our local St. John Astronomy Club, uh, and uh, of course the Rask NB uh, chapter as well. Uh, we use this calendar. Kurt uh, Nason puts this together, does a great job of it every month, and uh, he lists all the things that are happening throughout the month. I go through this to, to see what, uh, put, put my WhatsApp talk together. This one and Lisa's uh, chart both. Um, anyway, we can see here Jupiter opposition, the red spot, uh, a nice, there's a couple of the transits and what's happening next weekend, including a St. John Astronomy Club meeting to be determined, but it, that might not be happening because of the event. So, uh, so anyway, that's what's coming up, uh, next week. Right on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> somebody was asking, uh, any recommendations on a one and a quarter inch eyepiece or filters? You see the colors of the Orion Nebula. So if you're observing, not imaging, then you can use either uh, a nebula filter or if you're in really dark skies, you can use an O3 filter. Uh, the O3 filter um, might darken the surrounding portions of uh, the, red, the nebula, but uh, for the most part, it will enhance, uh, especially in dark skies. Um, the actual structure itself that you're trying to see, uh, but generally a good nebula filter will do uh, will do a good job as well. Yeah, so those cool. are the two filters recommended for looking at. For as far as the eyepiece eye goes, it depends on your scope. Like if you have a 60 millimeter scope, you don't want you know, no. you don't want to be using a nine millimeter <laughs> eyepiece. You want to you be need using a fair amount of light coming in for sure. <laughs> yourself a wider field as well. You know, yeah. maybe a, a 32 or up if you can, because you get that nice wide field around the nebula itself. Right. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Okay. Um, Paul, you ready for uh, Rosanna Fun Facts? Sure. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Look, he's in the Halloween mode. Look, pumpkins and now spider webs. Look. Well, I'm inside the pumpkin now. Oh, we are? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should have known. And I'm waiting for the spider to come down and... Uh, <laughs> Beside her and all yeah. that. Kind of oh, it's like constellation lines drawn to the different stars, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> what makes sense? <laughs> Nature right. at its best. <laughs> yeah, where where Rosanna went? I don't know she's here somewhere. Please give me a cent on, and I'll I'll find her. Yeah, he says he's got a six. He's using a six SE. So I'd be using a thirty-two millimeter. 
or 25 and up, I wouldn't use a smaller eyepiece for sure or lower, higher power. Okay. All right. So I'll share my screen. And this is this week's. Rosanna's Fun Fact. <laughs> Welcome back, Rosanna, for another great week, and I am so pleased to present what you had sent for us to talk about tonight. So she says, hi, Paul. There is a strange saying often used at weddings or other formal occasions of, well, don't you, uh, well, don't you clean up nice. This could be uh, construed as a bit of a backhand, a backhanded compliment because it implies perhaps you don't look rather nice at all <laughs> the rest of the life. However, one could certainly say that Neptune cleans up nice. The images of Neptune that the James Webb Space Telescope has recently sent back would make anyone take and do a double wow. Now, let's see what we got here. So just have a quick look at that. And that is absolutely amazing. These are the best images ever. Uh, of Neptune uh, with its rings and you can see clearly the moons that are going around it very close to uh, Neptune of course look at that galaxy yeah, down here in the corner and look at all the galaxies around it what am I saying anyway that's just an absolutely stunning image I'll try to blow that up so you can see a little bit better on what they shot and that image is just it's just it's just outstanding it really is it's an amazing image what they've done there so she goes on to say, uh, here is a close-up of the released uh, image by the James Webb Telescope. Isn't that something? I mean, that is just stunning. Wow. We have never seen anything like that before. Mm. That is just absolutely Incredible. amazing. So according to the Planetary Society, Neptune does not appear blue to the James Webb Telescope because it's methane gas strongly absorbs near infrared light. So that's interesting, considering they're shooting this with an infrared telescope. The planet is quite dark at uh, the James Webb Space Telescope's wavelengths, except where high altitude clouds are present. These are visible as bright patches in the planet's southern hemisphere. A thin line of brightness circling the planet's equator could be a visual signature of global atmospheric circulation that powers Neptune's winds and storms. A cool detail about Neptune is its moon's Triton. It's extremely bright. Its surface reflects 60 to 95 percent of the sunlight that reaches it. By contrast, our moon, which can appear incredibly bright, a full moon is bright enough to cause shadows on the Earth. Actually, that reflects at 11 percent. That is amazing. So another interesting aspect of uh, Triton is that it is the wedding crasher. Now, a news, this is from a New Scientist article states, Neptune has one of the weirdest collections of moons in our solar system, and it's Triton's fault. The planet's largest moon probably smashed into a calm moon's system that was there before it had arrived, knocking everything out of sync. Planetary scientists have long suspected that the huge moon Triton is an interlo uh, interloper from outside the Neptune system. Um, all of the other gas giants in our solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, have fairly similar systems uh, of moons. In each of these systems, the mass of the planet is 10,000 times bigger than the total mass of all the moons together. For the most part, these planets have several small moons all orbiting in the same direction as the planet spins. But Neptune is different. It has several tiny moons in either very close in or far away from the planet, most of which orbit in the direction of the planet's spin. And, uh, and one huge one, Triton, orbiting in the opposite direction. We have had only one spaceship photograph Triton, and that was a Voyager 2 back in 1989. Now, just like the Greek god Triton, son of Poseidon, Neptune's moon is pretty cool, figuratively and literally. It has the coldest object in our solar system, with surface temperatures averaging at minus 235 degrees Celsius, 
Perhaps one of the most exciting aspects is Voyager 2 photographed a plume of frozen material being ejected from the Triton surface, uh, an ice volcano is what they were calling it. And astronomers believe this material is to be composed of liquid nitrogen or methane. And that was it right there, it's shooting rid of the system. Wow. Now, Triton is not the only object in the solar system with ice volcanoes. Actually, we just talked about that. Uh, back in February 2020, these photos were taken uh, of Lake Michigan. And here are these ones are. And wow. meteorologist Tom uh, Nizoil uh, explained that the physics behind this strange phenomenon, they form as water is, uh, they, yeah, they form as water is pushed under the ice sheet. And as the press pressure builds up, the water shoots through the holes in the ice. Voyager scientists are not sure what makes Triton's ice volcanoes erupt. Maybe with further exploration by the James Webb Telescope, we can even get closer to Neptune and its strange moon, Triton. And that is this week's. Wow. Rosanna's Fun Fact. That is so cool. That is unbelievable. That yeah, is unbelievable. That's, uh, that, yeah. Unreal that they imaged it like that, and, and that that does make sense because methane does absorb heat. So you're, if you're using an infrared telescope, you're not going to get a whole lot of data, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But the data that they got is, yeah. I mean, regardless of how that looks, it's very definitive in uh, in what it's actually showing in the structures. Mm. And it was only Voyager okay. two that's ever imaged it before, and it, I think when they they found rings with Neptune before was that they were looking back at the sun, like from Voyager's position, they had Neptune there and they had the sun behind it and that's how the, the rings kind of popped out they had no idea that that had rings but that that yeah. one there reveals a whole lot nicer and it's it's not you know it's not that far out to well, get that kind of image because um, i remember seeing this a few days ago and when i first looked at it as i was just kind of scrolling through quickly i thought i was looking at saturn mm. and then i stopped and hold it hold the boat there's something different about that. Mm. <laughs> rewound it and had a look at it and wow well, it's yeah anyway it, the stuff that, that that telescope is revealing for oh, it's us. it's going to be crazy. It's like it's it's a whole new no whole new uh, time of exploration for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, Rosanna. Again, once again, another great talk. Um, okay, we're going to go do just a few photos then right now before we close out for the night. Um, let me get those opened up here. Yeah, I've only got a few uh, submittals this week, but that's okay. I figured everybody was kind of preoccupied maybe with the uh, hurricane and stuff too so hey even one is better than none <laughs> that's right that's right absolutely okay let me get my um folder going here i get that one open okay let's start up i'm going to share my screen i guess that's the first thing you got just a few photos but if you'd like to submit your photos we'd like getting them so we'll talk about that in a second to drag it down to the right screen so let's bring this one up over here here we go there you go that's there, appear. We are. there we are okay nice so we got this one from uh, matthew dupre matthew says my submission for the week i just took this one last night of the heart and soul nebula and the double star cluster well done yeah yeah very nice. he very says, nice. this is uh, about uh, 24 minutes worth of exposure time and i used a star tracker a canon t3 and a 50 milliliter, fifty millimeter Perfect. lens. There you go. So that's well what done. you can take with a camera. Yeah. Love that uh, double cluster too. Yeah, that's a oh, fa yeah. fascinating little spot to, to study with binoculars. That's a yeah. nice shot. Mm. Yeah. Well, well done. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, good job. Uh, I'm going to move on to uh, Duckman here. Duckman Arsenal sent this one. He said the calm before uh, Fiona in St. John. No <laughs> yeah. What a pretty sky though. The sunset yeah. was awesome the night before. It was, yeah, absolutely. And like you it just it went all orange. So you could see a split in the cloud and just orange underneath it. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Mm. It was the the uh, I imagine a lot, a lot of cloud cover would do that. Oh yeah. But we had. Thanks yeah, for that, Duckman. Okay, uh, we got Chris Benoit yeah. next of today's sun. Oh, wow, that's so, the activity, yeah. eh? Wow. Crazy. Lots that's and lots good. of activity. That's that's good for uh, for aurora for sure. Now well, we just need the to go away so we can photograph them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, well, yeah, so there's a few things happening right now. Like right around the equinox is uh, usually a good time for Aurora as well. Um, it's because part of our, I'll call it our magnetic field is kind of stripped back a bit. So we let we let more of the energy in from the sun. Um, more, of the, more of these charged particles. And it happens more around the equinoxes. Um, and if you go to any sites out there, you'll see that uh, people are advertising a lot of Aurora lately. Uh, it's all because of that. So, uh, but these uh, these groupings these are big groupings of sunspots. So I'm um, not Thank sure you. which one is the most active right now, but I know there's this is a group and that's another group. I think we can see that with the next photo actually. Um, this is Chris Benoit. Thank you, Chris. And, yeah, uh, nice shot. Let's move on to David Hoskins here. So David has him labeled, same image. Uh, David Hoskins has lots of sunspot groups visible today. So there we are, 3107, 3105, 3108, and uh, there's 3110 coming up around the corner too. So yep. we've got uh, lots of lots and lots of activity. Um, we aren't quite to solar maximum yet. We get uh, another three years before we get to solar maximum. So wow. this is this is really nice. Keep Good it signs. coming. Keep it coming. Yep. Yeah. Just keep them small so we don't put out the power grid, but keep them nice so we get Aurora. What's that thing in the middle? <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, the other opportunities for Aurora do arise. I, I get space weather alerts on my phone. I got 12 yesterday uh, just telling me about different uh, classes of solar flares that were, were happening on the sun. So anyway, lots lots there to look at. Um, Lisa Fanning sent this one. Uh, she said, I think I captured tonight's SpaceX launch. That was last week, actually. Uh, timing was mm -hmm. right. She said it roughly 12-ish 12, 12 minimum minutes between launch and uh in Florida, and visibility over my house in New Jersey. And yes, the, sir. And the smoke trail was headed in the right direction. So there you go. Melmouth County, Ooh, New yeah. Jersey. So well done. Yeah. Yeah. We're quite sure Mom. that's what that was, yeah. <clears throat> that would have been stage two, uh, of course, with everything still on it. But um, And I think we had another one, la another launch last night, and it was clear, I believe, last night. So I don't know uh, if anybody had a chance to witness last night's uh, uh, trail. And it was coming up the same... same uh, same path, basically, right up over the Maritimes kind of thing. So, so well done. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. I yeah. grabbed this one from Kathy Adams just before we went on air here. Um, Kathy said, nice, last, Kathy. last night's Jupiter, uh, it was a nice night, some clouds, but below average seeing. Now, with Jupiter so close to opposition, though, it was nice and bright, and I decided to image in it anyway. I processed three of the images, um, auto stackered, three times drizzle, and then Astro surface for all the three images and ran them through uh, wind jupos and derotated them. Uh, then finished up in Photoshop. I used wind jupos to derotate uh, one of the SER files prior to stacking, and that worked too. Thanks to Matthew for the tutorial on that. Uh, my little scope had fun last night, she said. So awesome. Yeah, well done. Good job. Thanks, Kathy. And if you'd like to send in your photos, we love getting them here. We love showing off your work. So please send them in to snaz at astronomybythebay.ca or you can also reach us at sundaynightastronomyshow at gmail.com. And before we, we get finishing up, I just want to put a challenge out for Mike's Bino Bud uh, with the 150th show coming up. Um, I have here uh, the binocular uh Binocular Guide to the Stars. This is something that you would use. I'm trying to get it on my screen. The yellow behind me. There we go. And this is something that you use to find targets, either naked eye or with binoculars, because it's designed to look for formations that allow you to find these things. The same uh, 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 field of view that Mike uses on his vinyl bud. So, um, so coming up to the 150 show, uh, anybody who's viewing out there with binoculars, go out and find a target. One of the targets that Mike's talked about over the last well, a little while, over a year now, and uh, just send it in to Chris, and then he'll compile just a list of the names that have sent in binocular targets that they've observed from Mike's uh, Bino Bud, and we will send this really thick and beautiful um, uh, binocular uh, book to you. Awesome. I want to know. <laughs> 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 look at something. <laughs> It's awesome, Paul. Thanks, thanks for that. Oh, that is yeah, awesome. So there, there we go. There's a challenge Good for everybody. Challenge. Send, send in your, uh, send in your binocular uh, targets, the ones that you observed, and let me know. And yeah, I like it. I will compile it. From uh, Mike's recommendation. That's awesome. So don't if need images. Have, just you're going to have to go on YouTube and go back some episodes, look for some of Mike's stuff because he's yeah. one. He's done it for the last. Uh, There's 52 uh, of them. Yeah. 52 of them. 
and uh, go out there and just find some. And it's just, it's fun anyway. Look at some old videos of us fools and get some of those uh, targets and send them in to Chris. And then uh, again, this is something that you can take anywhere. If you're out for a drive, you want to pull the car over in a dark space, just haul out your binoculars, go through the book and you have a ball. Yep. Well, great. Great. Good yeah. stuff. Um, Mark has asked me here, are you posting these photos on your website? Uh, Mark, I don't have a website. Um, they may be picked up by the St. John Astronomy Club website. At the moment, I don't have one, but I'm building one. And I will let everybody know when my website is complete to be able to go live. So keep it in keep it in mind. I will be po po And I would love to have a section on my website to take all of these photos that I've collected over the... I've got, I've got every, I think I've got every submittal so far. And I've collected them all in a little album. I'll put them all up there and let everybody have a look at everybody's uh, fantastic work that they've been turning out. So... So keep, keep tuned for that later on. But anyway, we're closing our show out now. So in closing then tonight, we'd like to thank you once again for your continued support of our efforts here. Our special thanks again, of course, to Rosanna for her, her continued contribution to our program. Great talk tonight, Rosanna. Thank you. Um, we really do appreciate it. We also hope all of you who joined us from the Rogers uh, Network enjoy the program tonight. If you would like more information about the wonders of the night sky, you can find me at astronomybythebay.ca. Uh, also, a special thanks to those of you who share our program, our friends Trudy, Brad, uh, David, all these people who are sharing our program. Trudy shares it, shares it everywhere. <laughs> we really <laughs> do appreciate it. <laughs> uh, remember, we do love getting your photos, so send them into snaz at astronomybythebay.ca or sundaynightastronomyshow at gmail.com, and we'll be happy to include them on our next broadcast. Now, if you have a suggestion for a topic for a future show, please let us know as well at the same address. And please let your friends and family know that we are here. We will be back next Sunday night at 8 p.m. on YouTube and Facebook to edutain you on astronomy. And I got to copyright that. Edutain you on astronomy and the wonders of the night sky. <laughs> so for now, then, from Mike and Paul and myself, uh, we wish you a safe and happy a few weeks, everybody. Um, lots and lots of clear sky. As we like to say, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes. Point it up. Good night, everyone. <laughs>